Good morning, everyone. My name is James Singletary, and I serve as one of the Associate Directors of Field Education at Columbia University School of Social Work under the leadership of our fearless and fabulous leader, Dr. Catherine Leake, who is an Associate Dean of Field Education and serves as this year's co-convener of the New York Area Field Directors Consortium. Unfortunately, Dr. Leake is unable to be with us this morning, and I am attempting to stand in her on her behalf. Notice I said attempting to stand in on her behalf. Yet, I would like to take this time on her behalf and on the behalf of all the members of the New York Area Field Directors to extend to each of you and every one of you a hearty welcome to the 35th Annual Symposium of Field Educators entitled The Collective Traumas of 2020 and 2021 Moving Forward, hosted by the New York Area Field Directors Consortium. We are thankful that so many of you have made the time to join us today as we continue to remember, to reflect, and to strive to reimagine how to move forward in spite of our circumstances, the challenges, and the conditions and the collective traumas imposed by these dueling pandemics, COVID-19 and racism during the 2020-21 academic calendar and beyond. We are in such gratitude to each and every one of you, your efforts, your expertise, and your capacity to remain committed and focused to our work as practitioners and field educators against the backdrop of COVID-19 and the turbulence in our society brought on by racism. Again, we welcome you and look forward to our shared experience and new insights that we hope this day will bring during this symposium. Before we continue with the opening remarks, I want to invite my colleague, Dr. Ovita Williams, to lead us through the Lenape Land Acknowledgement. Dr. Williams. Thank you and good morning. Thank you so much, James. I would like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Lenape nations on which we are learning and working and organizing today. I am here in New York City, or as the Lenape originally called it, Manahata, land, island of many hills, before the Dutch set foot on this island. I recognize Lenape hoking as Lenape land and that I have a responsibility to always remember, never forget, and to give respect and honor to the elders and peoples of Lenape hoking. In a number of countries and on native lands and tribal nations, people open up ceremonies, events, and begin all gatherings by acknowledging the lives of indigenous inhabitants of the land the people who were here first and subsequently brutally eliminated. By acknowledging indigenous nations, we show respect and take meaningful steps in correcting and salvaging the stories and practices that were erased by settler colonialists forcibly entering this land. Settlers never returning to their original land, violent acquisition of land, elimination of indigenous people, forced assimilation, creation of oppressive laws and policies, and the normalization of whiteness and patriarchy. The land acknowledgement allows us to bring to the forefront of our minds in all we do a recognition that our lived experiences, our stories, our ways of being, the ways in which we today live, work, and create family is on the legacy of settler colonialism, slavery and white domination. But land acknowledgement is more than mere words. It's about an action. It is about education, collaboration with native people, resiliency, reconciliation and building public awareness of the harms of colonization and the healing and demand for justice for First Nations people. We acknowledge the numerous enslaved Africans and their families, their descendants, whose forced labor contributed to the wealth of many educational institutions where many of us practice and to this nation. We honor their sacrifice and recognize their violent journey 
And we also recognize their resiliency and strength and beauty. We recognize that a nation was built on their backs, a sacrifice that to this day has been discounted. So we sit with indigenous peoples, honoring and recognizing history and culture and honoring the truth of this country and the truth of many lands. We pay respect to Lenape elders, both past and present, who are the keepers of their language and culture. So I invite you, we invite you to take this moment at a time that demands we don't sit still and we create change and repair a damaged history to remember, to honor, and to make amends with a history of genocide, slavery, and assimilation. I invite you to take just a minute with me and consider where you are and how you've contributed and what you will do. Just take a minute. Thank you all. And I'll turn it back over to James. Thank you, Dr. O. And we must always remember in order to move forward. So we thank you for leading us in the Law of a Land Acknowledgement. In our chosen vocation, we understand trauma and the emotional and the psychological implications imposed by traumatic events like what we have experienced during these pandemics. Those of us who are fortunate enough to have escaped death, either by the coronavirus or by systemic racism and other oppressive forces, we as skilled, capable, and competent social workers, field instructors, external supervisors, directors, clinicians, practitioners, and community partners, I believe that we have both the duty and the responsibility to reflect, to remember, and to reimagine ways to address these evil forces that bring about our collective traumas, ways to educate ourselves, our students, and our society around anti-racist knowledge, ways to build unity in community, ways to seek justice, equity, and equality for all, ways to rid humanity of the dastardly and the dishonorable treatment of black indigenous people of color and to rid ourselves of unnecessary loss and grief. For it has been said that an injustice to one is an injustice to all. We understand that this work is not easy and that it will require all hands on decks, open, open minds, open hearts to develop strategic ways to move forward. Yet, our work and our efforts to intervene and to create change must not cease and desist because of the difficulty and or the turbulence. Now is not the time to get tired. Now is not the time to be silent. Now is not the time to give up. Rather, we ought to strive to lean into our social work core values, including service and social justice. I like the way Dr. King said it. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. It is evident to me, and I hope to all of you here today that we have continued to move forward in the face of adversity. And today we are still moving forward as we come together to participate in the 35th annual symposium for field educators. This work is not light work and it has proven to be a very heavy lift for any one person or entity. Nevertheless, when we come together in unity, 
we have the power to build community so that we can make waves, move mountains, and change lives one person at a time. We have for you today an engaging, insightful, and informative day plan for you that will help us to rebuild, to reconcile, to restore our humanity as we move forward, united, pursuing liberty and justice for all. The agenda for today will feature two of Columbia University School of Social Work esteemed faculty members that will be introduced in the next segment. And they will jumpstart the day and take us into interactive workshops, engagement and panel presentations, moderated group discussions, shared reflections, and an opportunity to ask questions of our presenters. So again, as we continue to move forward, we want to shout out to each and every person on this Zoom call this morning, and give you a great big thank you for your efforts, your service, your dedication, and your commitment to all of you, the field instructors, the community partners, and all the schools that make up the New York Area Field Directors Consortium. We appreciate you, we thank you, and we look forward to our continued collaboration and moving forward together. Thank you, and thank you, and thank you. And at this time, I'm going to pitch it over to our Director of Field Education at Columbia School of Social Work, Octavia Whitfield. Great. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, James, for your inspiring words, your inspiring open re opening remarks to frame this wonderful event that we have planned today. I have the great pleasure of inviting Dr. Ovita Williams for our first panel presentation. Dr. Williams is the Executive Director of the CSSW Action Lab for Social Justice at Columbia School of Social Work. She also serves as Associate Director of Field Education and acted as Interim Dean and Director of the Department for two years. Dr. Williams has taught the Social Work Practice and Domestic Violence course at CSSW and the Social Work Practice Lab for Liberation and Social Justice at Silberman School of Social Work at Hunter CUNY. At Columbia, Dr. Williams has worked with students, alumni, faculty, and administrators on the development, and found of the development of the foundations course, Decolonizing Social Work Through a Power, Race, Oppression, and Privilege Framework. The course centers undoing anti-Black racism and dismantling white supremacy culture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ovita Williams. Thank you so much, Otavia. I, I love that I'm here with my colleagues from Columbia. I'm feeling the energy. Um, I wanna thank you for that introduction. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and try to uh, share my, my, my screen with you all. So let's give me a minute. Thank you. Thank you to the Consortium of the Schools of Social Work and Directors of Field Education for organizing today's presentation and inviting me, and particularly to Dean Leek, um, who worked with me and Dr. Shear to pull together today's discussion. Uh, to all of you social workers, field instructors, students, deans, faculty advisors, for taking the time to listen and participate in our discussion. And I want to thank my colleague, Kathy Shear. Um, I'm eager to talk with you and learn together with you today. I'm actually having a full circle moment. I was a new social worker attending this very symposium for many, many years. And every year I attend, I'm excited to soak up the wisdom of people I admired. I heard Dr. Daryl Wheeler and Dr. Carmen Ortiz Hedricks and Dr. Willie Tolliver, so many people that I admired. And um, I'm actually stunned that I'm here speaking with all of you and really honored uh, and I hope to leave you with something to take back to practice as well. It is pertinent that we are here at this very moment talking about the impact of racism and many isms, systems of oppression in social work and interrogating how we can do better if we are to maintain our commitment to social justice, not just to some, but for all. 
It has not been the first time that the symposium has offered a presentation or discussion about racism and diversity. What makes this year particularly imperative for reflection is interesting. Given that racism is not new, but given several recent years of our witnessing consecutive murders of black lives, our attention to the legacy of racism and the need to act has been ignited. I hope today we can engage in a way forward, which needs to look at social work, practice, and our commitment to anti-racism and liberation. Before we begin, I understand that you're gonna have a lot of feelings and emotions that'll come up today. And there will be different responses for people in the room. Reactions from native indigenous, black, Asian and Latinx folks may differ from white folks, or there may be uncertainty or confusion. At times throughout the morning, you may feel the need to take a few deep breaths, be off camera and center yourself. You may wanna write your feelings and emotions down and your thoughts. I encourage you to do so as you feel the need to hold the emotions and thoughts that you will experience today. So I invite you to do some mindfulness in this work. If we're not able to tune in, then we're less able to pull to that, the energy we need to, to do that self-awareness work. So I invite you to take some deep breaths. You can try now, feeling, inhaling, exhaling. Take 30 seconds to inhale slowly and exhale slowly, letting your body relax and feel the air moving through your body and filling your lungs, your heart, and your mind. And just access this breathing when you need to do so today. So where are we now? Many of you may be very aware of where you were when you heard and saw the video of George Floyd's murder exactly a year ago, May 25th to be, exist, to be exact. I froze, I was stunned. I could not watch the coverage. I remained in my pajamas all day and could barely respond to emails. I gave up midday through and sat in sheer sadness and pain. Since then, I spoke with many Black folks who were clearly broken and devastated. We had, in mass, faced a loss. This was not our biological son or daughter or family member, but yet all the lives lost to anti-Black racism were all a part of our community. Each loss was a trauma. Each loss was associated with feelings of grief. Each loss was a faint heartbeat of devastation and trauma. Mr. Floyd's death was a loss not only for his family, who will go on and grieve for the remainder of their lives and were recently re-traumatized during the, the trial of Siobhan, but for every Black person, young and old across this country and around this world. A collective loss, a collective grieving, a collective mourning. Many other murders of Black people we have come to see over grainy and graphic videos body cameras and 911 calls also conjure the same fundamental impact. Each comes with pain, a buildup of trauma and deep loss. I remember that morning in May, 2020, having been home for several months with my daughter, she's a teacher, in COVID-19 isolation. We were already angered, but not surprised by daily reports of pandemic disproportionality impacting black and brown communities. The COVID-19 crisis exposed racial and class inequities, laying bare another glaring example of anti-black racism. COVID deaths were higher in communities with large black populations due to inadequate, ac inadequate access to good health care, housing, generations of racial trauma already impacting mental and physical health in the form of high blood pressure and other chronic illnesses. Latinx and black people were subjected to severe economic hardships at a rate higher than white people during the last year. At that moment a year ago, the loss of loved ones due to COVID-19 was compounded by ongoing black, anti-black racism. 
Each time we witness the murder of a black brother and sister, one of us, and simultaneously suffered the inequities of the pandemic, there was anger and rage and grief and pain and exhaustion. There was uncertainty and anxiety, hopelessness and despair and fear. Who will be next? Whether killed by police or by a pandemic, the grief runs deep. This past year has been one of historical demands and movement across the country to end policing as we know it to be called. Calls for abolition or at least defunding the police and re-envisioning public safety. The past year has called for the end to the disregard of black and brown people, to, de to declare black lives matter. BLM, the BLM movement has generated community organizing and healing, creating a spirit of resiliency. It's been a year of asking the question, how do we dismantle systems of structural oppression and colonialist practices? We see a proliferation of corporations and businesses, sport teams, criminal legal settings are all requesting experts to conduct racial equity trainings and workshops. Probably many of you have been called to do just that. Then Siobhan's guilty verdict resulted in a bit of exhaling, but not celebratory in the sense I heard white colleagues claim joy. As a black community, the loss of one black life after another is laden with a history of racism, being devalued and violated and multiple wounds, open wounds of racial oppression. Celebrating felt empty and loaded. Some schools of social work have developed courses on racism and oppression and privilege, often at the demand of students. At Columbia, the past five years, has included students and faculty developing an anti-racist curriculum, which centers a power, racism, oppression, and privilege lens. The prop lens, as we call it, incorporates self-awareness, positionality, and an examination of anti-Black racism. <clears throat> Sorry. So, <clears throat> I'm going to assume that all in attendance are in various stages of understanding what is anti-Black racism. For some of you, the term is newish. And for others, the term is our lived experience and all too much our realities. Racism is a system of oppression that violates a targeted group and manifests through overt and oppressive attitudes and behaviors. Racism operates on an individual level, a structural level, and an institutional level. Anti-Black racism are attitudes and perceptions that have fostered white negative judgments about Blacks and Black culture. Anti-Black racism, the attitude and practice that involve the construction of Black people as fundamentally inferior and subhuman. Tanahisi Coates puts it really well. If there's one thing missing in our country, it's an acknowledgement of the broad humanity of Black folks. Racism and anti Black racism in particular is the belief that something, there's something wrong with Black people. Let's take it further. Think of a continuum if you will, or bookends. Anti-Black racism is a term that encompasses the ways in which anyone who's not deemed privileged on one end of the bookend, one end of the continuum, by various dominant identities and what it means to be white, and I can make a quick list about what, what that looks like. Male, cisgender, heteronormative, able-bodied, not Christian, not Muslim, not Jewish, English as a first language, heterosexual, rich, educated in informal education systems, younger or born in the US, anyone who doesn't fit what those dominant identities look like, proximity to whiteness, is positioned across this continuum of anti-Blackness and is Blackened. 
meaning positioned in a place of less privilege, increased targeting, scrutiny, violence, oppression, and less equitable access to resources. As we move across from one book end to the other, we see the increase in marginalization, oppression, exploitation, violence, and silencing, right? So on that other end, we see, and along this continuum, people of color, folks who identify as gay, queer folks, female identities, trans identities, poor, older, disabled, English as a second language, born elsewhere outside of the US, less formal dominant culture education, religious practices counter to the dominant culture. So to be clear, and this is where people often get really turned around and lost, anti-Black racism is not merely about race or skin color, although we have to start with the understanding of racism, but centers the concept of proximity to whiteness as the way we are socialized to think about privilege and disadvantage. Anti-Black racism is associated with the presumed inferiority and subjugation of groups with non-dominant identities and therefore targeted. For example, a cisgender white gay man will fall on this continuum toward dominant ideas of privilege, whereas a cisgender black gay man is positioned very differently. As two gay men, there will be examples of heterosexism and oppression around sexual identity. However, when we take a look at their racial identity, the impact of racism will make their experiences widely different. Kimberly Crenshaw coined the phrase intersectionality to describe this reality. Bottom line, we have a serious problem with anti-Black racism, and not only nationally, but globally, as you see on the slide I have now. We can look almost any place in the world and see examples of anti-Black racism. The very essence of being Black or Blackened across this continuum or these bookends encompasses deeply embedded beliefs about race and identities that are not privileged and therefore seen as non-dominant. Lighter skin color is deemed more attractive, economically advantaged and privileged. So we see skin whitening products are sold in many parts of the world. Just one example. And I have a list here of several, I just did a quick Google search of global anti-Black racism. And this is what we see. Throughout that pandemic and recently, the occurrences of anti-Asian and anti-AAPI violence has warranted an examination of anti-Black racism as it impacts our Asian American and Pacific Islanders. The AAPI community is positioned along this continuum as non-white and non-male, as most attacks have disproportionately targeted women and targeted by assumptions based on racial identity and gender. Then add assumptions and stereotypes around English as a, lang a second language or presumed immigration status or class. Another layer is the anti-Black racism within the AAPI community is shared by activists, as shared by activists, who are calling for solidarity with the Black community. White dominance and anti-Black racism impacts all of us and therefore calls for eliminating the racial divide and building solidarity among communities of color. And there are many other examples. So vicarious racism, maybe a new term for folks, involves people of color indirectly witnessing racialized attacks, comments and behaviors and attitudes that are targeted towards other people of color. This could be through observation, hearing someone's account of being a victim of anti-Black racism, listening or seeing images or narratives of people being racialized, which can be continuous and chronic. Therefore, the loss becomes continuous and chronic, affecting psychological and emotional well-being. Exposure to someone else's pain and loss builds up to the point of having a feeling of continuous sense of danger. The many stories of black and brown and AAPI communities, cis women, transgender women, and those deemed as less privileged is just that, living in constant fear of being harmed. From this perspective of, vic of vicarious racism, it makes sense that I was left in a state of shock and disbelief and anger and danger 
unable to function last May. Racial trauma is defined as the traumatic response to constant exposure to racism, racist practices, microaggressions, and discrimination. For example, exposure to death due to racialized crimes and racism. On top of this is historical trauma, leads to symptoms of anxiety, helplessness, intrusive thoughts, danger, flashbacks, sleeplessness, desensitization, loss of appetite, spiritual depletion, the list goes on. And the trauma is intergenerational in magnitude, passed down through generations affecting mental health, long-term health, and a feeling of how much more can we take? Karina Walter's work on historical drama is important to note, which refers to the role of historical events like the history of genocide, dislocation, and land seizure. And that context affects present day health inequities among Native American communities. Joy DeGru talks about post-slavery uh, post syndrome as well, same kind of context. These emotions and feelings don't just disappear or dissipate. They are long lasting. They're in every conversation, every gathering, every waking and sleeping hour. The feeling of loss is not just one's individual experience, but a collective loss, a loss that all BIPOC folks, Black Indigenous people of color and non-Black people of color experience in unison. There's a sense of mourning together that is powerful to understand. And this feeling of being unable to prevent the loss leads to a sense of powerlessness. There's a loss of humanity. Our loss is on public display, not private. We are forced to have people see our pain on display frequently and brutally. There's a loss of hope. Our fears of our own mortality and vulnerability are compounded. There's a loss of safety and security. No place is safe. The grocery store, a park, bird watching, even in our own homes. A loss of self, a death the whole community feels, the incompleteness, it's like missing a piece of a puzzle. Loss of control, loss of value, loss as a shared experience. We're all fighting against racism and injustices and we're unified in the struggle, grieving together for the community and the family that was directly impacted. We see our own children, our own family. This collective sense of grief and trauma collective anger, and collective fear. Grieving and healing together can take many forms and is necessary to cope with racial trauma and collective loss. What does that look like? Many different ways. Protests are collective response of community action, gathering and fighting against racial inequities, which strengthens our spirit and unites us in rebuilding, adds to our resiliency. Affinity spaces, some of you might, be a, might have been a part of affinity spaces. These are supportive sta spaces for people of similar identities. Within these spaces, there is, for example, uh, BIPOC folks being able to share and heal, talk and grieve outside of the gaze of white people, which is often what happens. Within group differences can be sorted out in affinity spaces when communities of color can discuss how anti-Black racism impacts all BIPOC folks and prevents taking our pain out on one another. Instead, we're supporting one another in the effort to dismantle white dominant systems of control and oppression. For white people, affinity spaces should focus on accountability, which means holding one another accountable to what it is to be anti-racist, discussing and managing white fragility without people of color having to protect and take care of. Our families are a sense of support and healing and community care. Counseling, but counseling designed by, with, and for Black people. Indigenous practices, community healing, mutual aid. And of course, why we are here today, talking with our students in an authentic and honest way in the supervisory and student relationship we we're, we're cultivating hope in us in the face of multiple oppressions and ongoing anti-black racism. 
But talking about racism is easier said than done. And we're gonna practice a little bit today in our breakout sessions with each other. It's probably one of the biggest perplexing activities social work instructors say is challenging in supervision and instruction. As educators, we have to start with ourselves, bring ourselves into the conversations from day one. I want you all to consider the following questions, but for now, cons consider these inquiries. What is your racial identity and how does it matter in your role as an educator, as a supervisor, as a social worker, in relation to the communities you serve? What prevents you from talking about race and racism? What are your privileged identities, your subjugated identities? What parts of your identity do you talk about less? We start with self-awareness and self-reflection. You and your student are partners sharing in the journey together. Mutuality and co-learning. You introduce from the very beginning discussions about oppression, dominance, and privilege. You use assignments like process recordings to have these discussions. We challenge the spaces that we're in. To end, last year, people, particularly white people, immediately posed the question, what can I do? And urgently proclaimed, something has to change. I didn't realize how bad racism was for black folks. And I thought things had changed. We can no longer avoid talking about anti-black racism. And as a profession, we can no longer sideswipe uprooting all forms of anti-black racism and oppression. As Toni Morrison said, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. There's no going back post COVID-19 and no going back to a place of complacency or ignorance to racial trauma and harms we witnessed this past year and hundreds of years. It's not about when, it's about now. Thank you all. Dr. Williams, thank you for providing us with an operational definition of anti-Black racism and ways to incorporate anti-racist dialogues into field education with a focus on social work practice through a, so, through a justice-based lens. So thank you so very much. At this time, I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Kathy Shear. Dr. Kathy Shear is an internist and psychiatrist. Dr. Kathy Shear is widely recognized for her work in bereavement studies. She has developed a targeted psychotherapy, complicated grief treatment for people unable to move forward after a loss, which has proved to be efficacious in three National Institute of Mental Health funded randomized controlled trials. She is the founding director of the Center for Complicated Grief, the only such center within a school of social work. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shear for our next panel presentation. Thank you so much, Atavia. Thank you to the consortium and to all of you who are here today. And a special thanks, of course, to my colleague, Ovita Williams, um, who I look forward to hopefully having a few minutes to chat with today, but also moving forward as a consequence, really, of the work that we've done with Dr. Catherine Leake, who I also want to give special thanks to this morning. Um, in preparation for this symposium. So I am going to also share my screen um, and and um, hopefully this will, yeah. And take us in a, a little bit different direction. Um, for now, because as, as you just heard, my my work is um, is in loss and grief, and it has been for now several decades. 
And I come from such a different place in a way. I mean, I, I haven't ever attended one of these symposia very, very much um, in contradistinction to Dr. Williams. And my background is in psychiatry, not in social work, although I've worked at the, the School of Social, I've been on the faculty at the School of Social Work at Columbia for now, I think it's close to 17 years. And it's been a really, really just remarkable experience, the best, I would say, of my career. And I often say these days, I've actually known this all my life, but I, I have the heart of a social worker. I may have a different degree, but I have the heart of a social worker and that I know. And maybe we'll have a chance to talk a little more about that in a few minutes. But for now, I want to I want to share with you what I think I've learned about loss and grief from the work that you heard that we've been doing. I've been doing with a team of colleagues over the past um, really 25 years or so. So I wanted to start with where we all are. We, this is something we all know so well. There's been... A, more than 3 million deaths globally, worldwide, and and more than 500,000, more than 580,000 in the United States alone. Many of them, the majority of them actually um, being people of color, which is just one more um, indication of what Dr. Williams just outlined so, um, so beautifully, so passionately, and so accurately. And last spring, we saw the first ever um, publication of an estimate of a, of a sort of scientifically based estimate of the number of bereaved people who result from every death. And this, as you can see here, was done by Ashton Verdere and his colleagues, who are demographers, sociologists, who had already collected data on kinship patterns in the United States and were able to segue that into an, a pretty good mathematically based estimate of the number of deaths, uh, the number of um, bereaved people per death from COVID alone. And that turns out to be roughly nine deaths per, nine bereaved people per death. So that's a, a huge number of bereaved people in our country. And we know that bereavement, just bereavement alone, is creates a risk. It's a, it's a highly, highly stressful event, and it creates a risk for virtually any mental or physical disorder. But we're going to talk mostly today about grief and adaptation to loss. And we, we all define grief differently. Sometimes when I give these talks, I show what, what happens if you Google the question, what is grief? And, the, and what you get is at least a dozen, maybe two dozen different answers. But we consider grief basically to be the response to loss. That's generally what's thought in the, in the grief world. And as such, it is a stress response because loss, again, is an enormous stressor. It's also, loss also typically incites or triggers a whole range of changes in our lives, just all kinds of changes in the world around us and within us. And very importantly, and this is kind of our um, key statement at the Center for Complicated Grief, it is, grief is the form love takes when someone we love dies. We sometimes talk about it as the price of love. It's literally the form of love. I think that's, that's something that we can derive from learning about um, what what it is that love is insofar as we can study love, which we can a little bit using attachment theory. But it's a sign, it, the response to loss, grief is the response to loss. It's a simple definition, but there's nothing simple about grief. It's, it's very complex. It contains all different kinds of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, the core of which is yearning and longing. We sometimes think of grief as sorrow. In fact, that's the definition in Merriam-Webster, but that's really not what is at the heart of grief. It's, it's really yearning and longing. And then, of course, there is sorrow. There's also almost always anxiety. There's almost always some degree of anger or resentment and guilty, remorse, self-blame, something like that. 
virtually any feeling that we're capable of, any painful feeling, is very often associated with grief. And actually, positive feelings are as well. But grief isn't one thing either for any given grief episode. It changes in the beginning. It changes erratically and unpredictably. And it also, in general, evolves over time as we adapt to the changes that are occurring as a consequence of the loss. And part of why it's part of why we need to adapt to it and part of why part of why we need to adapt to loss and part of why it changes in the ways that it does is because it our grief is affected very much affected by other people and other things that are going on in our lives and other things that happen after a loss and often these are unexpected and uncontrollable and that's part of what gets reflected in the experience of grief so it emerges naturally with strong emotions, again, the heart of which is yearning, longing, and insistent thoughts focused really on the person who died. And a lot of grief-related behaviors that tend to relate to um, keeping the person close, trying to, trying to avoid feeling that, we're, that we've lost them and honoring them in, in various ways and taking care of them. We also often have physical symptoms, including physical pain, and there are spiritual and social sort of consequences or aspects of grief as well. One of the other things that, that happens with grief is that it is such an intense, overwhelming experience. We have some automatic responses we sometimes call them writing reflexes that that's a term used by motivational in motivational interviewing you may be familiar with that usually refers to our writing reflexes for our clients in um, who are suffering but we also have them for ourselves and they take the form these are some of, the, of these eight these are some of the common ones that that um, we can't we don't have time to go into in depth but these are all these are all kinds of automatic reactions that we have to something that is highly, highly painful and unwanted. And they're important and they're, they're helpful in the short run. But in order to adapt to a loss, we have to change our expectations and our behavior to fit a world of absence. And to do that with it for a loss means accepting the reality of the loss, which is, is not an easy, straightforward thing to do. But that includes the finality of loss when, it, when the loss is death and the permanence of grief that accompanies a, a, a loss by death and the changed relationship to the person who died and the many, many other changes that accompany a loss, virtually always, certainly the loss of someone close. So we have to accept that new reality that we're in and really rebuild our capacity for well-being, which is also typically undermined by the experience of bereavement. And we use, in our thinking, self-determination theory, which talks about, it's actually quite well empirically validated um, theory that, that says that in order to experience flourishing or well-being, the capacity for well-being requires autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And autonomy in this context means actually having a sense of connection to our own core values and deepest interests. And through that connection, being able to do things that have a, that give us a sense of purpose and meaning and joy and satisfaction. We also need to have a sense of competence and confidence in ourselves. And we need to have a feeling of belonging and mattering in the world. And that we get through the promise and the actualization of satisfying meaningful relationships, the sense of community that's so important and so important, of course, to all of us. So as we adapt the, this intense sort of dominating experience of grief that really, really kind of blocks out almost everything else in our life is gradually transformed and softens and quiets 
and ultimately finds a place in our life we, which we call integrated grief um, but it's really a place in our life where where we can honor the person who died and at the same time yearn for them feel sad that they're gone have our grieving feelings but in a softer quieter form that doesn't dominate everything and even when we do that though there are times when grief is activated, strongly activated, typically for shorter periods of time, but this is anniversary reactions. It's times where any time of family gatherings and family holidays typically bring to mind the person who died and how much we miss them. And it can, they can activate grief fairly strongly for a period of time. And that's a, a very natural thing to happen. So I like to think in in sort of pictures and so this is a picture of what I've just said if you like that that's this and then sometimes though this doesn't happen and what happens the way that we think about prolonged grief disorder which is now a formal diagnosis in the DSM-5 um, is that these pause points that I showed you a few minutes ago become stuck points they really stop they they take over our minds again these are these are the idea the feeling of disbelief is just too strong and we can't get past it the protest the feeling of unfairness or wrongfulness is too strong and we can't get past it or we haven't we haven't found a way past it and or we can't stop thinking about how things could have and should have been different those kinds of sort of um thinking that kind of thinking about what's happened and also the tendency to avoid wanting to avoid activating grief becomes so strong that we are kind of very restricted in what we can do and how we can move forward in our life that's what ends up as prolonged grief disorder these are the official DSM-5 criteria. They have been published online, but not by the American Psychiatric Association yet, but they have been formally approved. So this is now a formal diagnosis. We expect that it will be formally um, announced by the American Psychiatric Association this summer. I know this because I, our group was a part of the, of the um, field people that advocated for the inclusion of this diagnosis in the DSM. It's also in the international um, criteria in the ICD-11. It has been, it is a formal diagnosis also called prolonged grief disorder. This is exactly the same thing we've been calling complicated grief. So there are common challenges, person related, some related to the relationship with the person who died and many related to the circumstances of the death and or the period after the grieving period that are listed on this slide that increase the risk that someone will experience prolonged grief. And really what that means is that it's harder to address those pause points or stuck points. The pandemic obviously does this. There's much more ongoing stress. We're all aware of that. And some people under enormous stress, others under less stress, everyone under some stress. There are more mental health problems. There are almost double the number of mental health problems sort of across the board. We've been seeing that. And a lot of us have been experiencing the um, seeking help by people with more mental health problems. Many of us have been experiencing more mental health problems ourselves. There's much more loss and grief. There are more, much, much more challenging circumstances of the deaths that are occurring during the pandemic and much less availability of comfort and support. All of that, what that devolves to is more, sort of more challenges that any bereaved person has to face. And specifically making it more difficult to move past some of those pause points and therefore more likely to experience persistent, pervasive yearning, longing, and um, preoccupation with the person who died and the things that go along with it. We also know that racism and historical trauma contribute to, to um, the 
risk for prolonged grief disorder. Um, and again, primarily this is in our colleagues with people of color. And I have to say though, that as I was listening to Ovita's presentation, I kept thinking that, you know, we, we know that race is a social construct. And so, and really what that means and it, what it clearly means is that we all, there's something wrong with those of us who aren't feeling when, when we hear about George Floyd, exactly what Ovita described feeling herself. So although these are actually experienced more so by our, our colleagues and our clients who are people of color, even we should be experiencing them all ourselves. And we, we of course need to keep them in mind as we work with our, our clients who, um, who are experiencing loss and trauma. So we are expecting a second wave, a sort of grief pandemic. The current death toll as of, I think yesterday, is over 584,000 people have died in the United States alone. And that leaves with using that, that nine multiplier that I showed you in the beginning, five and a half, almost, well, five and a quarter million people estimated bereaved. And this in the context, of course, of ongoing and to some degree not not well really not mitigated racism so we need to be prepared to support our bereaved clients um, and of course to be aware of the role of racism in historical trauma so i want to just say a few words about how we can do that and i would say at the heart of our work and at the heart of what any grief therapist does is active listening. Mostly bereaved people need to feel heard and we need to listen. And that means being present really with people who are suffering and being willing to be empathic, being able to be empathic with refraining from judgment and also maybe helping to promote adaptation and addressing those stuck points. That's where, that's where our work in particular comes into play. So we wanna foster a set of healing milestones. This is how we work in our prolonged grief disorder therapy, understanding and accepting grief, managing emotions, both painful ones and positive ones, which can also be difficult during acute grief to be able to see a promising future, to strengthen feelings of relatedness, strengthen our, our relationships with people who are still in our lives, to be able to tell the story of the death, to live with reminders and to connect with memories, meaningful connection with memories of the person who died. And of course, there's a lot more to say about each of these, but that's basically how we work in prolonged grief therapy. And again, to remind you of these stuck points, we also listen for these, we validate them because they're absolutely natural. There's nothing pathological about any of this. It's just that we need to help people pause, consider them and find ways to resolve them or set them aside in order to move forward in our own lives. We used, we do this through validation, support and guidance, guidance that is highly personalized through active listening and in general, this is how I like to think about what we're doing is basically grief is a cold, dark, lonely place. And we try to warm things up, turn on a light and open a door to the outside world. So I wanna leave you with the thought that grief is of course a common human experience. We have an innate capacity to adapt and we work with clients to help them do that basically. And these two quotes, I think, are, are very sort of heartening, especially the, the Helen Keller quote, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of overcoming it. So I will end it with this slide and um, thank you again for your attention. And I look forward very much so to working with you and hopefully with um, Ovita a bit before we stop today.
So thank you again for your attention. Dr. Scheer, thank you for providing us with a model of loss and grief that can be used broadly in field education while viewing grief and loss in the context of anti-Black racism. So thank you very much for your presentation. The next segment of our program will be a discussion between Dr. Williams and Dr. Scheer to further explore the connection between grief and loss and anti-Black racism. Additionally, presenters will address questions that were submitted prior to the start of this event. There will be an opportunity to ask questions and engage more during the workshop sessions. So now I will turn it over to Dr. Shear and Dr. Williams for an engaging discussion. Thank you, Octavia. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> Hi, Ovita. <laughs> So I, I'm not sure how much time we have, but we'll right. see what we what we get to in the little time that we do have. Sounds um, good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you know, I have worked at the school for about, I don't know, 16 years and uh, have heard so much about your, your complicated grief work. And, and you and I have not really worked together <laughs> at all. Right. And so it's it was it was interesting that we were called, brought together. And and um, when we were talking yesterday, um, we had talked about sharing our stories and our journey. Um, uh, and so, you know, the fact that we've worked together for so many years and not not come together um, is is maybe an interesting place to consider. <laughs> um, I totally agree, Avita. I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that also, and it's so interesting. I guess what we we were, in fact, we were. To, there's so many ways we haven't come together, and that, to some degree, is, you know, it's part and parcel of being on an academic fac faculty anywhere. I think it's it's often the case that people don't know what each other are doing exactly. I mean, we know what each other are doing, but in the most superficial way. But the other thing that we talked about, of course, is that as, you know, me as a white woman and you as a black woman, right. we, we have not ever had that discussion. We have never, had, we have never yeah. had that discussion. So yeah. I think that for the audience today, they're, they're witness to that, you know, and really mm -hmm. bear witness to how, um, you know, I'm, I identify as an Afro-Caribbean a uh, woman. My family's from Guyana, South America. They came here as immigrants back in 68. Um, and, you know, I've been educated in the, in the um, U.S. formal education system, so to speak. So my experience at Columbia, a predominantly white institution, is vastly different than yours, right? Yet we, we really haven't really sat together and really had that discussion with each other. Um, so yeah, I think starting with our racial identity and who we are and how we come to this place and how we come to, to our work. And I want to just highlight um, Dr. Kenneth Hardy's, you know, when we go into these discussions, what we need to center, you know, we need to be the expert in our own experiences, not those of others, right? Uh, to create space for telling our stories uh, to make space for those thoughts and feelings that come up. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm excited to sort of lean into this. I shared a little bit about um, who I am. I, I grew up in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, if anyone knows New York City. Crown Heights looks nothing like it did several years ago. Um, it's becoming pretty gentrified, but back in the 70s and 80s, um, it's a predominantly Jewish community and Afro-Caribbean community. And so there was a lot of opportunity for uh, no discussion to happen between the Jewish community and the Afro-Caribbean community. And these tensions were always there, I remember. Um, my grandma would go to Kingston Avenue and do her grocery shopping. Uh, Kingston Avenue in Brooklyn, um, uh, lots of Jewish grocers, and that would be the extent of communication. And then over 25 years ago, there was the Crown Heights riots. I was away at, away at college at the time. And, and the Crown Heights riots, I always tell people, it wasn't like it was something new. There were existing tensions between Black folks and Jewish folks in the Crown Heights community that literally, um, 
exploded. Uh, and I won't go into details, you can do that research. So, you know, coming from, from, from that background, that immigrant background, living in Crown Heights, um, uh, going to school in Brooklyn, and then going to a predominantly white institution and having to establish um, space for black voices at a predominantly white institution. So being a part of the Black Student Union um, and, and agitating the university and making demands. We took over main building at Vassar College back in the 80s. You know, that was, you know, a lot of where, you know, where uh, I've come from. Um, and then practicing in the field as a social worker. And then coming to Columbia and really, I say, having the privilege to even sit and have these conversations. Um, um, and, and be able to talk about race and to be able to facilitate these conversations um, and to work with my students. I have to say it's really my students that have uh, pushed and demanded for the school to move the way that it has. Um, and, and as a black faculty, feeling the pressure of being in an institution that, um, you know, how I show up, how I speak, how I dress, how I write, how I, all of that are the, the constant pressures that colleagues of color in higher ed talk about that I imagine is not an experience that you necessarily have in the way that, that we have it. Um, uh, and the constant microaggressions um, and then holding our students, black faculty, uh, queer faculty, we often have students who come to us. So it's like an added burden, an added you know, task that we have to also support and take care of, um, uh, of BIPOC students um, in, in the work that we do. So, you know, I'm not sure if this is new to you, Kathy, or you've never heard, or you heard some of this, but to share it with you today, I, you know, I appreciate your sort of taking that in. Um, uh, and I'll stop there and let you share a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are. Sure, and thank you so much, Ovita. And yes, you're right. I mean, it's not entirely new, but it's new for it's new in a personal way. And I think, you know, I think you said this so well. But it, it really matters. What matters is the personal. It, it sort of, in a way, when it's when it's general knowledge, it doesn't it doesn't have the same effect. It doesn't have the same meaning as knowing, you know, as imagining you in those places, imagining you, your experiences as you describe them which I was doing. So me, I'm, I'm, the, um, I'm the granddaughter, I would say, of, of um, Eastern European, Russian, Polish, Jewish immigrants on both sides of my family. And they came to this country in the, in the late 1800s. Um, my, my parents grew up in pretty much in poverty, but they but then they, their families, my parents moved out of poverty pretty dramatically. And I myself was raised definitely in an upper middle class family in, Saint, in the Saint, suburbs of St. Louis. My mother was a political activist, actually. She was a feminist and she was um, a member of the Missouri Status of Commission of Women in the 1960s or late 50s even, and was eventually one of the people that started the um, the a, a version of the um, well she, um, of the women's political caucus in St. Louis with people my age. She she joined with a group of women my age, and and they decided that they would support her because of where she lived. They thought she could possibly win an election, and so they supported her to to run for the Missouri State legislature, which she did in, in 1972, which was the year I graduated from medical school, and um, with a lot of trepidation because she hadn't graduated from high school, uh, from college. She graduated from high school, but not college because her father said that it, girls didn't need to go to college. And um, and so she, she became a really rampant um, activist. I'm feeling a little emotional right this minute. Anyway, she and she did. She was she was did a lot of what we would call now anti-racist kinds of bills. She she promoted. Um, I'm saying it that way because she was not 
she was an anti-racist in her thinking and in her actions, but in her in her emotions in our family, as I said to you yesterday, Ovita, and yet, you know, we were a racist family. There's no question about that in my mind. Now, actually, the first time I learned about this um, was my, my younger daughter. I have two daughters. One, my younger one was in college, and she was taking a social psychology class, and they, they, um, they in, introduced this implicit bias um, test that you could do. And, and I did it, and I came out racist, and I was, like, shocked by that. This was probably in the in the um, late 1990s. And, um, and, you know, and, and that I, because my actions also followed my mother's I, in, in my work, I always, um, I always did things in the black community. I deliberately did things in the black community. All the, all of my work was done in the black community as well as any other place I, I was working. And, um, and so I didn't, I didn't feel, I didn't, I didn't understand that at the moment, but it started, it planted a seed, which was dramatically sort of more um, activated, I guess, by uh, one of my colleagues at the School of, of Social Work, who said to me about five years ago, um, we had coffee together, he was joining our faculty, and we had coffee together, and he said, at, in that coffee, you know, Kathy, the, the real problem in racism is not the racists in the South. It's the, it's the liberal, quote unquote, liberal whites. And I was just like, I said, what? I said, well, I don't understand that. And, and, and I asked him to explain and he said, I, I can't really explain it. But so, and, and I didn't stop thinking about it. And actually in the last two years I have read, I just counted them 50 books by um, black activists and, or, a couple of them were black novelists, but but um, primarily anti-racist activists. And I've learned a tremendous amount. And in that learning, many of these books actually are historical, and they go back through that period of the 1960s and 70s when I was working with my mother often, and and also just my whole my whole personal experience, like yours, Avita, a lot of demonstrating, a lot of, um, of you know, of sort of political activism, but not really understanding. And and you know, you I, actually one of the questions is how do I ident identify racially? And and actually, I guess I, I was thinking about this. I don't think I exactly identify as white because I think many white people are like this. I think I identify as not a person of color, actually. Mm. And interesting. Uh, yeah. And 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 I think also that that the form that the form I can identify with in in races and being a racist is fear. I think it's it's fear of its othering, actually. It's like it's as though a person of color isn't. And I think this is what is so absolutely um just it's so important to, that we have to stop this because we we have to get to know each other personally we don't get to know each other personally mm -hmm. as much as we I think yeah I think getting to know each other for sure like I'm all about like having the dialogue and also owning what you need to own you know so it, it's interesting that you say you don't identify as white mm -hmm. because what is distancing from that whiteness mean for mm -hmm. you ultimately to continue to do this work, to do uh, anti-racist work. Um, Kendi says, you know, if you're, you know, if you're not uh, be, if you're not racist, you know, you're- If you're not anti an anti-racist. Yeah, it's just you're, you're racist, right? right. Like, yes. you know, so, so claiming your whiteness, you know, is for me hearing that I'll just, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take this moment to take care of you because that's usually what black folks do. Ken Hardy talks about this, but the impact for me, the impact yes. for me is that you're not claiming your whiteness and distancing from that draws me further away from, from you, right? And so, you know, however you understand that, you know, knowing that it doesn't necessarily um, lean towards my wanting to lean further in, it actually does the opposite, if that makes sense to you. It makes sense um, and it makes me sad, but it, because, because actually, I think there's another perspective here, Ovita, which is that race is not a thing. 
I mean, it really isn't a thing. No, no, we know that, right? It isn't. However, we see, the, we, we both talked today about the impact of what racism yes. does do, right? So yes. that inherently is operating continually. And so I, I think that, yes, there's a construction to this and there's a reality to what that construction has then historically led to. And so we've got to figure out like how to, to un, undo that and, and, Exactly. You know, I agree. so it really is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's all of that. You know? And I think, I think we don't, I don't think we want to really be taking care. Definitely. You should not be taking care of me. I think that's correct. I mean, but, and I, and I, I guess I was thinking, should I be taking care of you? Is it time for me to take care of you? But I don't exactly think so. I think it's not as respectful. No. <laughs> it's not as respectful. Right. Yeah. And I so mean, I think that's to why honor I each about, other. Yes. Well, well, that's why I talk about the affinity spaces because, you know, at Columbia, there is currently a white affinity space right now yes. and, a, and a non-black people of color affinity space. And we've had people of color affinity spaces that white affinity space. And I don't know if you're connected or. I, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that you could speak a lot to what that, what the work is that needs to be done there. And I, it's not taken care of, but it's like the accountability piece, right? So, you know, I, I, I find my community around, among folks of color within the profession. I'm doing a lot of racial equity work with folks of color. Um, and, but interestingly enough, I was talking to another colleague and I just wrote about this, that my career as a social worker has been so informed by whiteness. You know, social work as a profession is embedded right. in white dominance, right? So, you know, so I, I, in decolonizing the way that I think about social work has been a lot of the work as a person of color I've been doing and also connecting with across the, the diaspora of folks of color. Um, and, and building community at Columbia for, for Black folks who we are feeling quite marginalized half the time that we're walking into the doors or getting on Zoom, you know, that constant fight, that constant uh, acclamation, even going through the doctorate program and sort of establishing, um, you know, that, that voice. I'm writing with some black, black colleagues now about being in higher ed and the added burden uh, that's associated with that, that added burden is, is, is tremendous, you know? So, so yeah, I mean, I, I know we've got like literally a minute left. <laughs> we're being asked to move over, but I, you know, I appreciate that we were able to go there a bit with each other and there's so more, more to be said. And, I, and I'm actually hoping Kathy that you and I could actually have more of this together. I, I'm but so I happy really, to hear you say yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm glad that people got to bear witness to this and all of its messiness and complexities and ambiguity. I really appreciate that people took the time to sort of listen into this. And I'm interested in the breakout room to see what people's reactions were to this conversation. Thanks, Ovita. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I trust that you had very engaging conversations in your workshop sessions with Dr. Shear and Dr. Williams. At this time, we will share a few highlights and um, share out a few questions, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Tricia Snyder, to lead that portion. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for everybody to engage in these conversations today. This is by no means um, might not do justice to what we've been able to participate in, to per participate in today, but I'm gonna do my best. So um, initially this morning, hearing from Dr. Williams in related to recognizing anti-Black racism, trauma, loss, and healing, um, she discussed we can, as a collective, not a discussion for some, but for all. Racism, racism is not new, but our passion for action might have been more ignited by recent events. We have a unique and powerful role as social workers and um, organizing related justice efforts in our own communities. We must intentionally work towards equity and liberation, including dismantling institutional barriers for those whom have generally, generationally and historically been disenfranchised and marginalized. Our responsibility is to confront those in power and privilege and empower those who might believe that they are powerless. Um, we were reminded to practice mindfulness, to center ourselves, to quiet ourselves in our minds through the straining work. 
I know for me as a member of the Rochester, New York community, we have a rich history of rising up and challenging injustice, including being the, ho being the home of Frederick Douglass and in 1964 as one of the earliest civil rights marches. However, we are also the community where Daniel Prude, a black man with mental health challenges was brutally killed by police in 2020 as well. That event was hidden by those in power, including those of color in power. This was another incident where those that committed these atrocities were not held accountable. Our community has continued to rise, march, and fight in unity with others across our nation and globally to bring visibility to these instances of violence. We can strengthen our spirit and unite us in resiliency, honoring the associated grief and loss through various strategies at micro, meso, and macro levels. Each loss was a trauma, and not only for the families of those who lost loved ones, but also for members of the local communities where these events occurred, as well as those where collectives rose up to march in unity as anti-racism change agents. Through self-awareness, um, educators, field instructors, and their students, must engage in self-reflection to evolve our own self-awareness, challenge our own assumptions, and model this accountability and continuous improvement process for others. Some highlights of Dr. Shear's portion. Um, she is at heart a social worker, even if her original discipline um, was different than social work. We, uh, she briefly discussed the global grief and loss related to the COVID pandemic with some of the earliest research proving that having a family member recently die is tied to an elevated risk of physical and mental health decline, as well as broader adverse implications for individuals, social, economic, and relationship well-being, um, and noting that that came from Ashton at all. Grief is a response to loss. It is extremely complex, messy, and unpredictable as a stress response and a trigger for permanent changes. Those impacts evolve over time and change us forever. In an acute form, it triggers strong emotions, insists thoughts, physical symptoms, and grief-related behaviors that can be interpreted, interpreted by some as anger and aggression by those who do not apply human behavior in the social environment and cultural humility perspectives. In order to adapt to loss, we must consider integrated grief and intentionally apply a self-determination lens in order to establish well-being. We must have a connection to our own belief systems and develop our own competence and abilities to create satisfying and meaningful relationships for collaborative healing. This is incredibly difficult for most who are already drowning in prolonged generational and historical trauma, grief, and loss. Of course, this was compounded by the prolonged trauma, grief, and loss related to the pandemic, as well as social, economic, and racial reckonings of the last year and a half, more ongoing stress, more mental health challenges, and more grief and loss. A second wave of grief is coming. We must prepare as 584,000 have died in the US alone and 5.5 million, 5 .5 million people are estimated to be grieving currently. We must actively listen, demonstrate and understand grief and loss as well as teach our clients, colleagues, communities and ourselves through validation, support and guidance as personalized. Grief is a common human experience, and we as social workers must have an innate capacity to adapt and to support others to do the same. Um, we, in the breakout session, uh, or I'm sorry, in the conversation between Dr. Williams and Dr. Shear, we discussed exciting opportunities to continue this work collaboratively in research and conversation, as they have both been part of the same faculty, but have yet to come together prior to today how our intersecting identities, who we are and how we come to this place, expert in our own experiences to create space to share our unique stories. From our microchasm of experiences to having a dedication to establish a space for black voices through access to higher education from Dr. Williams while also acknowledging the constant pressures on BIPOC educators and students that are truly exhausting. Dr. Shear, 
um, shared her own experiences of um, not truly in it, that even engaging in this work does not truly enable those of us in power and privilege to know what those experiences are for other identities and other communities. From her own background of those that came to this country as immigrants in the late 1800s, to her mother being a passionate feminist, but her family also having ingrained implicit bias as white, even as they participated in social justice efforts. Um, noting it's not just the racism in the South, but further the racism of liberal persons in the North that we must be aware of and address and dismantle. In Intentionally Learning and Activism, Dr. Shear shared that she identifies as not a person of color in order to demonstrate a resistance to othering in order to get to know each other on more of a personal level. Um, in both breakout sessions, this was noted as a, a crucial part in the conversation today. Dr. Williams stressed owning what you know and the work you need to continue to do as you grow, rather than folks of color often feeling like they need to take care of others um, as they engage in conversations around white fragility. While racism is a social construct and not biological, it has intense effect on those who experience it from those who have more power and privilege. We must acknowledge and honor this. One approach for those shared conversations is the establishment of affinity groups. Social work as a profession is vastly impacted by white culture, culture from formal education to field education. Some of the breakout highlights, um, as I said before, were the conversations between um, Dr. Williams and Dr. Shear. We must sit in those difficult spaces, be willing to engage in those spaces, and knowing and realizing that we cannot use the word safe in relation to those spaces because it's subjective and different for everyone, but we can encourage those in power and privilege to step back so that others can use their voice books and suggestions for white folks to do the work, um, even as social workers included um, a suggestion such as white fragility, as well as what white supremacy and me, um, as well as the journaling process um, should be required for all social workers. Um, the Grief and Loss Group talked about the need for collective healing for BIPOC communities as they lose elders who historically have anchored their families and communities how to help people who can't say goodbye to someone during this year due to COVID restrictions and secondary trauma to social workers as an impact of uh, the pandemic related to things such as PTSD and grief symptoms. Whew, that was a lot. <laughs> I am going to turn it over to Ben so he can um, speak to the process after today from NYU and then I'll be coming back um, for closing remarks. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you for that incredible summary. I don't know how you did that. That was amazing. Um, I really, my name is Ben Sher. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the director of the Office of Global and Lifelong Learning at the NYU Silver School of Social Work. Quite honored to partner with the Field Educator Symposium for today. Um, I think as a white cisgender heterosexual man with a Jewish background, I would be doing a disservice if I didn't say, I know I still have work to do and I need to continue the work. And as Dr. Williams said, the work continues past today. So please think about continuing it if you hadn't come to this thinking about it. And I would like to drop in the chat if I have access to the chat, I'm not seeing my access. Um, the, ah, there it is, sorry. Uh, the registration for the continuing education credits, I'm gonna drop that in now. So I just put that into the chat. That is where you will go to register to access your continuing education credits for today if you are here for that purpose. Uh, you'll need to register with our portal. And then uh, once you register, you should get an automatic email from our um, silver.continuingeducation at nyu.edu um, email address that will have a link to the post-event evaluation. You must complete that in order to access your CE credits. And then within 48 to 72 hours from that timeframe, you should get another email 
from silver.continuingeducation at nyu.edu that tells you that your certificate is now ready for download in our portal. Please make sure to check your spam or your junk mail uh, folder because unfortunately sometimes the silver.continuingeducation at nyu.edu email does go to that location. And of course, if you have any questions or concerns about accessing your CE, you can email us um, and we'll be happy to take care of that. And I believe now I'm passing it back over to Otavia. That would be to Tricia Snyder. Oh, sorry, back to Tricia. Thanks, thanks, Ben, I appreciate that. Um, and so as we close out our time together today, I am just so thankful to have been able to be in this space with everybody who participated. As James mentioned at the onset, onset of our time together today, our collective community has the, it has the um, responsibility to make sure we are living an injustice to one is an injustice to all. We must keep moving forward, united as social workers and as empathetic communities and individuals um, through grace and cultural humility. From Ijomo Lewo, there is an anti-racist quote that I am reminded of and that I reference every day. The beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism to be an anti-racist. Anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it, including in yourself. And that's the only way forward. We know, honor, and appreciate our field instructors. We truly could not do it without you. You play a crucial role in the support of our programs and our students and us as field directors. This is magnified by infinity over the course of the last year and a half of health, social, economic, and racial crises. Thank you for joining us today. You went above and beyond while also experiencing compounding demands of your personal, familiar, and spiritual identities. You did not disengage for your own self-care, although that certainly would have been warranted. You demonstrated unwavering commitment to your social work interns so that they were gifted with meaningful growth opportunities through creative and flexible learning experiences. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Last but not least, uh, I want to acknowledge and thank our school, our sponsoring school partners, Adelphi University School of Social Work, SUNY Brockport Social Work, Columbia University School of Social Work, Lehman College Department of Social Work, CUNY, Long Island University um, Social Work Department, Ramapo College of New Jersey Social Work Department, Rutgers School of Social Work, the State University of New Jersey, University at Albany School of Social Welfare, Silberman School of Social Work at Hunter College, CUNY, New York University Silver School of Social Work, Stony Brook University School of Social Welfare, Toro College Graduate School of Social Work, Yeshiva University Wurzweiler School of Social Work, and the College of Staten Island Social Work Department. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and please reach back out. I and the rest of us, again, just are so thankful to have been in this space today. Thank you to Dr. Williams and Dr. Shear um, in sharing um, your unique perspectives and engaging in the conversation today.